Um, I was a student here way back in 1986. I came to Newcastle. Um, have we got any first years in the room? Ah, oh, good, you're brave, OK. Um, can anybody shout out how much the university is charging you a week uh, for your halls of residence, just roughly? 75. OK, I think I paid about £10 a week, and that's not inflation, that's 75. Any second years? OK, what is it a week at the moment? I guess you're out of the university. Roughly how much is it a week? 75. 75 a week? Ben Wall in 1987 was £9 a week. OK, you did have slugs, but it was, <laughs> it was £9 a week. Um, Fenham was £13. Jasmine was a little bit more uh, back then. Anybody, anybody bought a house recently in Newcastle? You got any, any young lecturers or older lecturers? <laughs> <laughs> anybody willing to? Or, we know people. What, what, what would a house go for, saying Long Benton or that kind of free bed house at the moment? Must be somebody who's got an idea. 210? Yep, yeah. way back in the 90s I bought a lovely little free bed house for 50,000 and sold it for 50,000. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm renting again now, um, so you really shouldn't be looking, listening to me that much, because if I was really an expert on housing, I would have done a lot better <laughs> than I'd done. I always bought in the north, moved for a job south and rented, because I couldn't believe the house prices. Went back up north, bought, sold, went back down and rented. But my, my point, the reason for going through that with you and those kind of prices is something's happened in the last 20 or 30 years to mean that housing has become much, much more expensive. Um, and it's not that we've been paying lots of people to build new houses. A lot of the housing that you'll be renting existed when I was here. In fact, it may be a little bit more dilapidated than when I was here because they haven't fixed up the roofs. Most of the new built housing, well, most of the housing that, that people are buying, of course, was here. What's, what's happened is that the prices, the, the value, the worth, the supposed worth of this stock has gone up and up and up. And so your rents have gone higher because the people who own the houses that you're renting need to pay more money for the mortgages to allow them to own it. And if you're buying a house, you're having to pay more for it because supposedly it's worth more. And I'm interested in, in how that happened and what can be done about it. Uh, the reason I'm interested is because if you talk about a crisis in general and things going wrong in society, it's fairly abstract. If you look at housing, how you're housed, how much you worry about your housed, how you think you're going to end up being housed in the future, you can make it much more concrete. I start off with this picture because this picture was used in a lecture by a man called Robert Frank way back, I think, in the year 2000. Robert Frank's an economist. And Robert Frank wrote a book about the problems of the middle class in America where he predicted that there was going to be an almighty crisis because of housing. Um, many, many people have claimed they predicted it. The most recent I've seen is Janet Yelland, who's about, <laughs> if she gets through Congress, will become... Uh, the chair of the Federal Reserve. But Robert Frank really did predict it and say that the problem is that we're getting people at the top of American society who want houses that look like this, houses with studies and spare rooms and family rooms and a bigger house than you need. And people just below them in American society are trying to get slightly bigger houses, better houses, living in a better area. And people below them who might have rented and now taken out a desperate subprime mortgage, just as way back in 2000. And it's all going to lead to trouble. Now, the key thing about Robert Frank, and here's the reference, 2001, how rising inequality harms the middle class. He wasn't any old economist. Robert Frank was Professor of Economics who co-wrote a series of textbooks with a bloke called Ben Bernanke. And Ben Bernanke is the outgoing 
chair of the Federal Reserve. People at the top of American society knew what was coming. They wrote about what was coming, but they didn't know what to do about it. They definitely didn't want it to happen, uh, certainly as it did happen, because it came very close in 2008 to bringing the entire banking system down. It was unpredictable. And they didn't want the end result, um, which is instability, massive pumping in of money uh, to the markets going on here and in the US. And this kind of thing, this graph here is showing the average number of days that people in various states in the United States have been living in their houses paying no mortgage because they can no longer pay the mortgage but the bank isn't repossessing the property. By 2012, in New York State, it had got up to an average of three years that people were sitting in property not paying for it. They could be evicted at any point. And we're not told the story in Britain of what happened in many parts of the United States. We're not told that over in Ireland, property is still at less than half its 2008 peak. We're not told in Spain, as it's still going down, has gone below half its 2008 peak. Um, we're told not to worry. It'll all be okay, and there's a special little help to buy scheme coming out, just in case it isn't okay. We're told we have to have huge budget cuts, but somehow the Chancellor can find £10 billion to help landlords buy houses, £12 billion, that was the last budget, to underwrite £130 billion of mortgages. There's huge amounts of money available in Britain to prop up the housing market. And my suggestion to you is that the reason there's a huge amount of money to prop up the housing market isn't just a desire from the Conservatives to win the 2015 election, although there's no way they can win the 2015 election if you have a housing market crash. It's fear of this kind of thing happening here. And a deep-seated personal interest of a set of people in the value of the London property market. This is what Britain looks like if you draw areas in proportion to how much the housing is worth. So if you've got very good eyesight, can somebody spot Newcastle? <laughs> okay. We've got Newcastle is up there. Um, but that, that is what this country looks like from the point of view of residential property. And that's what it looks like from the point of view of vested interest in the value of residential property. And of course that bit in the middle is getting bigger and bigger. You're looking at an average price of now approaching half a million for a standard little three-bed property in London. The minimum in Barking and Dagenham is 250,000. And you can walk on certain streets in Kensington and Chelsea and Westminster, and in about five minutes you can walk, walk past buildings that are worth more than entire countries in other parts of the world. You're walking past buildings that are worth more than if they'd been painted in quite a thick layer of gold. <laughs> I'd, like to work, I'd like to work out how much. Um, but if, if you think about some of these prices and some of these values, um, it's not about the actual worth of these things, it's, it's a kind of fictional idea that somehow, because everybody else thinks it's worth it, it is worth it. I should say this, let me go back and say something about Dave. Um, we have a lot of houses. One thing I'm going to argue with you, and, and the reason I'm doing this is because I really would like to know your, your views on this and where I'm going wrong. The current major policy suggestion to deal with the problem in Britain is to say we need to build more houses. We've never actually had more houses than we have now. We're not building them at a very fast rate, but we have more per family than we've ever had. And the key thing is we've got more rooms than ever before, because we have been adding lots of rooms on, especially in the south. 
rooms over garages, rooms in the roof. If you look at bedrooms, if you just look at inner London, inner London's got more bedrooms, according to the census. The census counted bedrooms for the first time last time, which is partly why they're going to cancel it <laughs> for 2021. There are more bedrooms in inner London than there are people. So if nobody wanted to sleep with anybody else in inner London, <laughs> everybody could still have their own bedroom. Um, we have an enormous number of bedrooms. Part of the reason why we have so many and so many houses is because we've got more people who own more than one houses. Mr Cameron owns how many houses? Or did when he said this. This was 2009. Any guesses? Three, very close, four, four, um, with Sam Amphers as well, in the rather large estate just outside Scunthorpe. Um, nothing on his American counterpart at the time. John McCain didn't know how many houses he owned. He said he thought it might be six. His aide said eight. It eventually turned out to be 11. Young Barack Obama really did only own one house in Chicago. Uh, and that kind of thing helped him. And it'll be interesting to see whether this comes up at all in Britain. This difference between people's lives, living expenses and experiences. Just got a couple of graphs to show you about tall buildings. Um, partly because Steve told me he's, he's doing stuff on vertical uh, buildings at the moment. These are graphs of the number of tall buildings built in New York per year. And you'll see that you tend to get this sort of spur to skyscrapers just after an economic crash, because they're commissioned before the economic crash. Once you have the crash in 1929, you stop commissioning more skyscrapers, but you still have to build them, because you've, you've got everything in train. Another little crash in the 70s, little crash in the 80s, and so on. That's just for New York, and that was just buildings over 70 metres tall. This is worldwide, and it's buildings over 256 metres tall. And the reason for putting it up is fairly obvious. Something dramatic has happened recently. It may be that this is the beginning of many, many enormous skyscrapers worldwide, or it may be that this is just like New York shortly after 1929. We'll find out. The reason I think it's more like New York in 1929 are graphs like this. Um, the black line here is how many billions of US dollars a year were being borrowed by people to buy houses over time from the 1980s onwards. So people borrow money, they get into more and more debt to buy houses. You get a housing bubble. They borrow enormous amounts of money, and then that line comes crashing down, and people start, in the US, paying back more than they're borrowing. It's a tiny little recovery, and then it went down again. Banks can't cope if people don't get into debt. Banks don't work if people end up paying them more back than they borrow from them, because the banks need people to lend money to. The dotted line there is credit card borrowing, which is going up at the moment. You often get stories telling you that things are getting better again, or there's green shoots of recovery. House prices are going up apparently in the States again. Uh, this morning we got a very nice report from the Red Cross, which you may have seen about the whole s the state of societies across Europe, saying that supposed recoveries across Europe really, from the point of most people, <coughs> are pretty meaningless. This is a picture of a block of flats just outside the station in Sheffield. It's the Park Hill flats. You can't see the graffiti there, but it says, I love you, will you marry me? Uh, a young man hung upside down to spray that for his girlfriend. And a developing corporation called Urban Splash decided to use that as their logo to try and sell the flats that they've done up. They're not doing very well. Of course, they don't tell you they're not doing very well. You can tell they're not doing very well because only one block has been done up and all the other blocks are empty. And we have lots and lots of this around Britain, of refurbishment, regeneration programs that have just kind of stopped. 
even in London, the number of cranes has halved in the last year. Put up there. Here's another one of these graphs just to give you an idea that this is strange, this is new, this is very different. This is foreclosures and repossessions in the United States. One difficulty with living through a crisis or a time of economic crisis is that you adapt to it or you begin to think it's normal. If you're fairly young, it's all you've ever economically known. So, so what's so strange about it? I can remember when the first soup kitchens began to open about four, four years ago, the first food banks. Now I take my children to a school where a very nice lady sits outside the school gate with a tray to collect tins every morning in a very posh part of Oxford. It's become normalised. It's become... But it wasn't like this not too long ago. This is the house price roller coaster over time. This is the three month moving average. The point of showing it you is it's unpredictable. It's like any market. If you could predict it, you could make an awful lot of money. People think, some people think they can predict uh, these things, but it's almost fractal in its way of behaving. I draw the little line going down, um, and a set of people led by Danny Blanchflower who used to be on the Monetary Policy Committee, say we're still 20 to 30% overpriced, including the OECD who say we're 20 to 30% overpriced. But you could take that bottom 2008 peak and some of the others and say it's going to go up. If you were sad enough as I am <laughs> to have spent part of your summer reading newspaper reports about house prices in Britain, we went from anything from there about to be a bubble that was about to crash to there being this is at a low we're about to see incredible increases in house prices. Nobody knows what's going to happen. All you do know is that bubbles do eventually crash but there's no guarantee about how big they can get before they do crash. We're also in a very strange situation at the moment. In our average house prices nationally are beginning to rise. They behave very differently in different parts of the country. They're rising in richer parts of Newcastle, falling overall. Zooming up at the moment in London, although Westminster fell by 7% in August. Uh, but they're generally going up. And at the same time, average wages and salaries are going down. Those people who are members of the UCU union We'll know that academic salaries have gone down, is it 13% in the last five years in real terms? Um, but the cost of buying houses is going up. It can't carry on forever. Um, it can carry on a bit if you have fewer and fewer people owning houses and more and more people renting. And we have an incredible increase in people renting at the moment. But it can't carry on forever. Other things that are occurring because of this, or which I think are occurring because of this, which tend to get talked down, are uh, we're now, for the first time since the 1930s, seeing rising absolute death rates in the elderly. That is a higher percentage of old people dying this year compared to the year before, compared to the year before. Uh, the Public Health England response to this in August was to say it's the flu. It's, it's the flu. We're getting more flu. But there's a European report saying that Britain had remarkably little flu in the last two years compared to other parts of Europe. What has happened in the last couple of years is that for elderly people, particularly poorer elderly people, which largely means women, because the men die earlier, life has become more dangerous, more insecure, more worrying especially if you're in a care home, like one of those Southern Cross care homes, which were going bust a couple of years ago. And when things get harder at those ages, and people worry more and are more fearful, death rates rise. These graphics come from a report produced by Oxfam, 
Oxfam as a charity started, I think, in the 1960s in Oxford to worry about people in Africa. Oxfam now does more and more work about people in the UK um, and produces these, these graphs. I'll show you another one in a minute. They get kind of simpler and simpler to try to get over some of the issues that are occurring. Uh, one reason I put the waiting staff in is that the almost the only occupation for young people in Britain that's becoming more common is waiting on tables at the moment, but the amount of money that's being earned is going down. And at the same time, in the centre of London, you're looking at the £60 million flat, the £300 million mansion, the super rich of the world flocking in to a low tax Treasure Island economy, and the idea that maybe we could exist like that. Maybe we can become the kind of Singapore of Europe. Low taxes, let the rich in, educate the children of the super rich of the world, bring them into our universities, charge them £15,000 a year, stop worrying about local students. We could be the, the Swiss finishing school, if you like, for the world's rich, and somewhere safe for them to come and buy their fourth, fifth or sixth home that kind of plan. Another one of these graphs from Oxfam. I'm going to try and not to press you towards the end, but just to give you some kind of feeling of the context of what's going on. If you wonder how come house prices are going up, well the poorest tenth of course never bought a house anyway. Even under right to buy, the very poorest tenth hardly bought any houses. They're bought by better off um, people. The richest tenth have seen the smallest drop in their incomes and spending and they're the ones who most often buy houses, sometimes more than one house. I think we're getting almost to the end of the graphs and I'll get on to some suggestions that I'd like to know what you think about. This is work done by Becky Tunstall, who's a professor in housing at the University of York and I think it's some of the nicest work being done looking at census data and it shows you why you need a census and what's good about censuses. Becky's looked at every census since 1911. Uh, we didn't have one during the war. And she's taken her research up to 2011. And what she's looked at is how many rooms have people got? And she compares the best off temp in society, the best off temp of people, with the worst off temp in terms of rooms. And it's just a top graph, forget, forget the other two lines. Way back in 1911, the best off temp of people had four times as many rooms in their home as the worst off temp. They might have only had, say, one room per person, and the worst off temp might have been squeezing four into a room, but it was four times, four to one. That inequality in housing rose between 1911 and 1921 just as inequalities in wealth rose, just as inequalities in income rose. Right. Around about 1921 is about as unequal as we've ever been in this country. And then a whole series of things happened. We brought in more death duties on the rich. We increased income taxes. Trade unions got more powerful. The elite began sc became scared. They became scared because of something that happened in Russia that was very scary, if you will remember the elite. Um, and by 1939, half of the inequality we had in income had gone. Uh, then the Second World War, which helped crystallise it until we got to 1978, which was our most equal period by income. What you'll see now is housing. By 1978, the richest 1% of people in Britain only got six times average income after tax, just four times average. Imagine bankers getting £100,000 a year. That's what happened in 1978. Um, that was the kind of... And a banker was a normal-ish person who worked in a bank, who you might meet if you wanted to borrow some money. You'd go in and sit behind a desk and they'd tut-tut at you. Um, and they, they would earn four times more than you. Since then, 
Inequalities in income and wealth have risen dramatically. The richest 1% now take about 15%, heading towards 20%. And at the same time, maybe just coincidentally, the number of rooms that the best of 10th of people have in Britain, compared to the worst of 10th, has escalated so that by 2011, the best of 10th of people in Britain have five times as many rooms in their houses as the worst of 10th. And almost all of those rooms will be empty, including most of their bedrooms. But these aren't the people who have to pay the bedroom tax. The people who are having to pay the bedroom tax and being evicted from their housing right now, I was told earlier this afternoon that the first evictions in Newcastle are now taking place, are the poorest in society who live in social housing where people squeeze the best into the houses they've got. What's happened in the last 10 years is that you've had increased overcrowding of the poor, particularly in London, and the better off people who tend to be older can often find they're living on their own in a, in a house with six or seven or eight or nine rooms, have seen the value of their property rise, and are rattling around in more and more bigger houses at exactly the same time as we're told we need to build a million new homes. Um, I, you can see why I go on and think this, this is important research and why it's great we have a census. If we didn't have a census, we wouldn't know how many rooms there were in these houses. We wouldn't be able to work out how many are empty. We wouldn't know how many bedrooms are not being used. We wouldn't know that almost all the bedrooms that are not being used are in houses that are fully paid off and owned by the people who, who are living in them. There's certainly enough bedrooms in Britain for every family to have a spare room. The problem is that some families have many spare bedrooms. Three more slides and then I'll shut up, so please think of some questions for me. I think what is required are a series of options of what you begin to do about this. Um, I have no objection to building a few more houses, particularly if we have a few more people coming. Uh, we have about 1% of the world's adults in the United Kingdom and only half a percent of the world's children. Um, we have a fairly high rate of immigration for Europe. If that's going to continue, we're going to have to build more houses. But trying to sell house building on the grounds that it's going to help more immigration isn't, no political party is going to take that one. Well, maybe the Greens will. <laughs> you never know. Um, so what can be done? We need to bring the value, the supposed value of property down, I'd suggest. I think the easiest way to do that, to do this, is to thank whichever genius brought the council tax bans in. You know the council tax is banded A, B, C, D, E, F, G, I think H, and Wales has got I. Um, they left the rest of the alphabet. So it's absolutely stroke of genius. Okay? Forget about Clegg's idea or Ed Miliband's idea of a mansion tax, because you get all this moaning about Oh, the poor old pensioner in a £2 million house won't be able to pay it because you get a cut-off. Just add new bands to the council tax at J, K, L, M, N, O. Double them every time so that the person in the £60 million flat is paying a lot more than the person in the £30 million. The minute you do that, the value of that housing begins to go down because if you buy it, you've got to pay this higher tax and you can make the tax proportionate and if somebody can't pay it they can always find another house they can live in that maybe just costs five million rather than ten million. Um, it's a kind of move towards a land and property tax but it's entirely doable. The kind of more advanced things you could try and do is update the property valuation that the council tax is based on which I think in England is still in the early 1990s uh, how do you do it? You go on to Zoopla. <laughs> if you don't know, you have to be my age to know about Zoopla and trying to buy a house in Oxford. Which <laughs> is <laughs> great for bringing the realities of all this to home. Zoopla will tell you within a couple of thousand pounds what the value of a, ho of a home is. You don't need armies of people going out and valuing them. Um, 
It can be done by Zoopla. Or if you don't believe it can be done, you can look to Ireland. Ireland is bringing in a land and value tax right now. Ireland estimates it that 3% of the cost of that tax will be taken up in producing the entire register of Irish property, of which they have almost nothing to begin with. We have a property gazetteer that covers at least 60% of the property of Britain already. We could do it, except, of course, if you remember that graph of London, there are a very small group of people with an incredibly deep-seated interest in us not doing this, um, because that's where their wealth is, and so they don't want it taxed. But if you don't want to have sky-high rents and sky-high house prices, you've got to do something to encourage people not to pay more and more for this. And it's circular. The minute you do discourage people, the minute you begin to bring the prices down, so that you don't think the property is going to carry on rising in price ever more, well, how much do you really want to pay for it? Because the price is based on an expectation that it will carry on rising. People don't become buy-to-let landlords because they really want to be a landlord. If any of you are in your second or third year and you've got a landlord in the private sector, that person didn't wake up one day and said, I really like students. <laughs> I really like students. Students are nice people, they serve a fair deal. I'm going to become a student landlord and I'll try and make their experience of being a student really nice by making sure that the home is lovely they're in. I won't overcharge them for the rent. I, that, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. When, when, I have to tell you, when I lived here, um, I won't <laughs> tell you his name, uh, our landlord, this was in Heaton, we'd gone up in the world, our landlord in Heaton wanted us out. Uh, we didn't want to be out and we had a short, yeah, short-term tenancy, but we still had two months. He wanted us out, I said no, you've got to give us two months. I was working up there in the geography department, I came home one day and he'd taken the roof off. <laughs> I said, you can't do that. He said, it was unsafe. Um, that may be where my dislike of landlords began. But essentially, your landlord isn't in it for you. They're also not in it for your £70 a week, although that's useful to them. They're in it mainly because they think the value of that property is going to carry on rising, and they'll be able to really cream it off students in 10 years' time, who they'll charge £140 or £200 a week for exactly the same flat that I was paying £9 or £13 to be in. I'm not going to get through these unless I, I speed up. But please tell me what ideas you think might work, which ones are absolutely a known starter, and any others. We have a thing called the right to sell, at least in Scotland, Wales, and England, in Northern Ireland, it's being blocked by a DUP minister. The right to sell is not taken up very much, but the right to sell is that if you have got a mortgage and you're finding it hard to pay your mortgage, but you want to stay in a house, because your kids are going to local school, you can apply to become a tenant and for a housing association to take over your house and you can carry on living in it. It's the opposite to the right to buy. Uh, Labour accelerated it, but still there are only a few thousand sales. The right to sell is great because it means that if you pay lots of money for your house because it's a long way away from the council estate, you're being stupid because next door could become a council house. And again, location, location, location is the main thing which determines prices locally. If we can get rid of that, we've got a, an advantage. Second homes, holiday homes, empty commercial property, all of that wasted space needs to be taxed so that if somebody really wants to leave it empty, they can pay for the right to do it. There's no need to tax single spare bedrooms. We increasingly need a single spare bedroom. Any of you that are going home at Christmas are going to need somewhere to sleep. Um, if people want people to visit, they need somewhere to put them up. We actually have enough bedrooms without building any more houses for people to have a spare bedroom. We will need more houses to be built if more people come to Britain. But the main reason we'll be building more houses in Britain in the next few years, if we do, is so that we can demolish more houses in Newcastle. That's, that's, if there is an enhanced building programme, 
it'll be balanced by more demolitions again as happened 10, 15 years ago, as the country tilts towards the south. We need rents to stop going up. Uh, we have a lovely possible system of rent control, if you're interested in one. If any of you are currently claiming housing benefit, actually you're probably okay here. But you know these things called local housing allowances? So you may, there's a maximum amount of money you can claim housing benefit for. And above that you've got to find the money yourself. That could actually be used as a rent control limit. Why allow a landlord to charge more than what the government thinks is a fair rent? Many countries have got rent controls. New York City has rent controls. Vienna has rent controls. People who are renting are naive consumers. Um, you don't have much power over your landlords. You need collectively somebody to look after your interests. And the best way they can look after your interests is to not allow you to be charged an unfair amount of money to rent, but also to begin to demand decent standards of provision. Um, whenever people come from mainland Europe to work in universities in Britain, one of the first things that they often say to me is, what's the problem with the housing here? Why isn't it sound insulated? Why is it not warm? Um, and I have to explain that we just let the landlords do what they want since the 1980s. I haven't said anything about squatting, um, but we've made squatting a criminal offence. Um, my impression of squatting is it's largely done in London by young middle class uh, people. Um, but we shall see what happens there. I also haven't talked very much about some of the illegal activity that's now taking place, again mainly in the south of England. There are estimates that over 2,000 garden sheds are rented out in Slough alone. People are sleeping in garden sheds. People are renting out rooms to entire families again in London. It's Victorian levels of overcrowding that are occurring. If you really want to deter landlords from doing this kind of thing, um, then you threaten them, I think, with imprisonment and see if that works. Because this is damaging to people's um, health. It's damaging to hygiene in general. And lastly, in this list of things, we need to recognise that housing should last for a long time. Most of us will only live, if we're lucky, uh, for 80, or if you're female and young, 90 years. Most housing exists for 150, 200 years. It's expensive to build housing, but it's even more expensive to knock housing down and build housing somewhere else. And it's even more expensive to build housing that's going to stay empty because somebody's decided to buy it to speculate. Over the last 10 years, the population of at the very centre of London, of Kensington, has actually fallen as the population of the rest of London has gone up because people are increasingly buying property in Kensington not to live in, but as an investment because it's worth more. And that, that has to end at some point. Thank you very much for putting up with me. Uh, please let me know what you think of these ideas. Thank you.